glory to Jesus. Why do we give him all the glory? Because he is worthy. Why is he worthy? Number one, he is God. Number two, he loved us. Number three, he died for our sins. Number four, he rose from the dead. Number five, he gave us power and he gave us freedom. So to him be all the glory. This is Pastor Henry Madava coming to you from Kiev, Ukraine. And this is the voice of victory. Hallelujah. You see, God does not do anything half-baked. And I remember one time I was given some fresh bread. You know, I went into a restaurant and they said, you know, a restaurant, we have fresh bread. I was so happy. But then when they gave me the fresh bread, I realized it was very good on the outside. When I opened it, inside, where the crust of the bread was, it wasn't fully baked. It was half-baked bread. You see, when Jesus gives you life, he does not half-save you. He saves you completely. So, uh, Jesus, when he died and you believed him, you are totally saved. That needs to be deep inside of you. I am saved, I'm born again, I'm completely saved, I'm, in the, I'm a child of God, I'm in the kingdom of God. When you know you are completely, totally saved, your approach to life is different. Let's watch this video because today God is going to bless you and help you to be grounded in your salvation. The title of my sermon today is, I am completely saved. Salvation is that very issue of which God said that people will always have that inner testimony, I am saved. As soon as this testimony disappears or is minimized or shaken, we need to immediately fix it. It's always a sign that something is wrong. When the testimony about my 100% salvation is shaken. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the word of God, who has called us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel to which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Hold fast to the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed to you, keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Paul writes to Timothy, and please note it from the text that we've just read. Paul states that God saved us. He saved us. Secondly, God has called us with a holy calling. It means that when he saved us, he gave us a certain method of walking. That is the calling he gave us, because he called us to something. But what he called us to is called a holy calling. That is, walking in God is called a holy walking, because it coincides with God's standards. To live a life according to God's standards is not a religiousness and not a legalism, but it is what God called us to, to walk according to his standards. Because there are some people, when you say, live according to God's expectations, they say, you are religious. No. When one lives his life according to God's expectations, 
His life stealing money is not a sign the person is not religious, but it's rather a sign that the person is not saved. It's a sign that you live according to the devil's standards. And that's why you need to choose what standards you will live according to. But God saved us. He called us to his holy calling. Say amen. Number three. It says, he called us according to his plan and according to his grace. He didn't save us. We didn't save ourselves. He saved us. It wasn't our plan. It was not our arrangements. But he saved us according to his plan and according to his grace. Why are humans important to God? The book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Please note that God created everything on the earth to make sure that everything, plants, trees, animals, will produce according to its kind, in its own image. That's how they were created. All animals, all plants. And God said, let them be multiplied according to its kind. But God also wanted to have someone according to his kind, in his own image, to make sure there is someone on earth who will represent him, someone in his own image. So humanity was God's greatest creation because God created a miniature himself. That's why a human life is very precious. When Satan noticed how much humans were similar to God, he noticed that we have God's abilities. He decided to trick the man. I'd say he decided to try to do it. The devil was not sure that the man would agree. He wasn't sure the man would say, okay. So he decided to try. My opinion is that Satan approached Adam not for the first time. But in other cases, he was probably like a mosquito to Adam, and Adam didn't pay any attention at all. Probably the devil did his tricks, but Adam didn't pay attention. So one day the devil decided to lure the man through Eve. The devil is impudent. That's why when Satan saw a man with these divine qualities, he decided if a human with these divine qualities will change sides, then I can do a lot of things. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, Now the servant was more cunning than any other beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. So the devil decided to use a serpent. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the servant said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and trees desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Please note what happened. Eve had seen that tree all the time. 
It's not that this tree sprung up suddenly and now she sees it. Wow, there's a new tree here in the garden. Let's go and study it. This tree was there all the time. Please note the process how the devil enticed Eve. He wanted to make sure that the tree had another meaning, not the one it had before. The main task of the devil was to make sure the tree now means something different, not what it meant before. It appears that Eve had to make a choice, whether to choose the truth of God or just what she feels. The devil asked the question, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve said, no, we may eat, but not of this tree, lest we die. The devil said, no, this tree is good, you shall not die. There's always a choice between what I feel and what God says. Satan said, if you'll eat, you'll be like God's knowing good and evil. You'll have this and that and this and that. The devil lures people using his false promises. He doesn't use anything else. What promises does the devil make today? I promise you great success. I promise you'll have love and happiness. I promise you'll have money, promotion, Elevation and popularity, promotion and popularity, success and money, love and happiness are three main things the devil always uses to seduce people. It's probably one of the reasons why the devil came not to Adam, but to Eve, knowing her tendencies. So if you notice, any tendencies in your children from early childhood. It's not necessary to be sinful tendencies, but tendencies in any area. For instance, they don't know how to put all things in order. They often forget about something. Don't think these things will disappear by themselves in a while. No, they won't disappear. They will stay there even when they grow old. If you don't believe me, then ask your father or mother if they're still alive. Ask them, do you see in me, an adult man or woman, some tendencies I had when I was a child? And you'll be surprised when you hear their answer. That's why the Bible emphasizes so many times we need to teach our children. Many of you are still fighting in life those things that were supposed to be removed when you were still a child. But because you received everything you wanted, now you are suffering, and you don't know how to get rid of it. But praise God that in Jesus Christ, we are renewed. In Romans 3, verse 23, it said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So first of all, we have sinned through Adam. Secondly, we, those who were made in God's image, were separated from God. So we have God's likeness, but without God. We appeared in a situation where we look just like God, but are without Him. We were separated from God. So what happened? When we were separated from God, Satan started to exploit humanity. It's an exploitation of humanity by the devil. We sinned through Adam, and the devil began to exploit us 100%. We began to extend his kingdom. We began to help him to achieve his goals. And God had two options. Number one, to burn us together with the devil. to destroy us because God has created us in his likeness and we fight against him. What should he do with us? Plan number two, to save us. 
The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6, it says how God decided to save us. He decided, I'll go to the earth, I'll take care of their sicknesses, I'll carry all their diseases. It's written, Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He fully redeemed us. He redeemed us completely. We can see it in these verses that our spirit, soul, and body are completely saved. So you and I return to God's original state in Jesus Christ. Say, in Christ, I am completely redeemed. Say, it is paid for my spirit, for my soul, and for my body. Say, in Christ, I am coming back to God's original that was there from the beginning. So with the appearance of Jesus Christ, the same kind of people like Adam before his fall appeared on the earth as well. You can't find these people somewhere else but only in Christ. Where you can find those people? In Christ. Who is in Christ here? So if you are in Christ, then congratulations. You returned to the original state, like Adam had it in the very beginning. Now I have relations with God. I have some common actions with God. God is for me. In Christ, I am walking with God. In Christ, God is for me. In Christ, I am the strongest one. In Christ, I am returned back to God's original state. Do you understand what happened in Christ? The concept of being in Christ means you have become a person like you were supposed to be. Had never been there. The world we live in is a sinful world, but you are in Christ. So that God's original, your God's original, whom God created from the very beginning, live there and stay there. Be married there. Give birth to your children there. Raise your grandchildren there. Do your business there. Work there. Serve there. But never leave that God's territory called in Christ.